I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and our guest today is the wonderful Michael Shannon to talk about his current projects, Tammy and George, in which he plays the titular title character, George Jones, as well as Waco, The Aftermath, which he's also an executive producer on. And in starting with talking about Tammy and George, um, there's something that you've, you've spoken about in terms of the research process in that there's always so many different versions of what the potential truth of any moment in his life might have been. There's the way that he would describe things in his book, the way that Tammy would describe things, the way that their daughter Georgette would describe it. Um, and so I was so interested in, in how you approached going through so much research material, but from different perspectives to find a version of a truth that you wanted to capture in, in how you played him on screen. Yeah, well, I think my guide in that really was uh, was Abe, Sylvia, you know, because Abe had done that research, uh, writing the show for so many years, so much longer than I had. And uh, he had talked to, to so many people and um, I kind of let him dictate, you know, what the version of the story was going to be. Um, you know, there's certain situations where you can kind of speculate just based on your own common sense. Well, it was probably like this, and he's probably being defensive, or she might be overstating this, or, you know, you, you have a hunch about things, you know, um, and you just kind of, it's it, a lot of it's just your gut instinct, you know. And in, in playing someone that is so known in the public eye, you know, one of the challenges is trying to master mannerisms and, and all these different characteristics and traits. And, and I think it, there's something really amazing that you, you've spoken about previously with this project in saying that you had to kind of allow yourself that space of, I'm never going to 100% be him. So there are going to be spaces that aren't completely who he is. And I was just interested in that that journey for you in in really trying to master so many of the details, but also allowing that that space of you know there's always going to be something that that's not a hundred percent accurate in portraying someone who's real and who's so known. Yeah, I mean, well, there's there's just things that'd be impossible for me to do anything about. I mean, I I went to the Country Music Hall of Fame and I I looked at his suit. They they have like a, a an outfit for each performer in these kind of plexiglass uh, boxes, and it, I was like, I I couldn't fit in that suit. That tiny. I mean, he was he wasn't he wasn't a very big fella, you know. Um, and that's all right. Like, you know, what am I gonna do? Uh, I always thought I would look at a. I'd look at Walt Goggins, who was playing Peanut. I was like, oh man, he'd make a he'd make a good George Jones. He looks like George Jones. And then I found out that um that he had actually been approached about playing George uh, by another production. But um yeah, I don't know. It's it, it it's you're really doing a disservice to the story if you get too fixated on um imitating somebody it's really not the point of it you know what's you know the show is called tammy and george or george and tammy for a reason because uh, it's about the the two of them and their relationship and that's really for me what you need to focus on you know and, and with the vocal performances, you know, it was you and Jessica Chastain giving live performances on on set. Um, but the two of you did lay down some tracks ahead of time so that, you know, if anything had happened to either of your voices during production, there still would have been a vocal track that they could have used in the film. Um, and I wanted to ask about working with Ron Browning, who was the vocal coach that you were working with prior to production and, and really just spending a lot of time with him and how even going into a studio to lay down those tracks kind of really helped you to find your version of his voice as a musician. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, when, when, when you're recording, I mean, it's helpful because you can, you can lay it down and then you can listen back to it, which is not something when we were just studying with Ron, we didn't really get that opportunity. And we just had to kind of listen to Ron say, well, this is what it was like. And, 
you know, you think when you're singing and there's some a song coming out of your mouth, you're like, well, I can hear that. I'm, I'm the one making this sound. Um, but uh, when you listen to it recorded and played back, you, you really start to notice things that you just wouldn't be able to notice otherwise. Um, and it can be, uh, it can be a brutal experience, you know, but, uh, but you develop uh, a thick skin, you know, uh, and basically at a certain point, uh, you get comfortable with it just out of exhaustion. You just get tired and you're like, well, um, you stop being so anxious about it and then it kind of settles into you, you know. And what, what's so beautiful about the musical performances in the series is it's not just capturing the essence, it's telling a story through music. Yeah. Um, you know, and even if you look at them performing the same songs over the years, there's so many different iterations and versions of, of the story being told with the exact same song. Um, and so how did you kind of go into a lot of the musical performances in the series, really kind of focusing, focusing on the contextualization of what's happening around at the them at the moment, you know, where is he going to be emotionally for how you wanted to deliver all of those musical performances in so many different ways with so many different emotional tones to them. Yeah. Well, yeah, frankly, that was, that was one of the most exciting elements for me of doing the show. Um, and Jess and I had spent a lot of time uh, watching performances uh, between setups or whatnot. We'd hang out and, you know, you can go on YouTube, you can pull up Golden Ring, for example, and you can see 20 different performances of Golden Ring. You can see, like, early on, when they sing it early on, you can see when they're older and George is out of his mind on Coke and Tammy's like rail thin and you know um and everything in between and uh and you know those were that that that's that was an amazing uh resource for us um uh because they're very those performances are they're very revealing you know I think anybody watching those performances is getting a an excellent opportunity to see where George and Tammy are at in their lives at that particular moment, you know? Um, so we, we use those as a kind of jumping off point. And then, you know, just you know, basically just charting where we were at in the story, kind of like what you say and, and where our relationship is at. I think, you know, the one thing I always felt, um, is that when they were singing together, it was this kind of um, private domain between the two of them. And it, 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 it's fascinating because it, there's nothing private about it at all. They're in, in front of hundreds or thousands of people. And yet there's something going on between them that we can only watch, but we're not necessarily privy to. It's incredibly intimate connection and uh and so that was challenging to try and for jessica and i to try and simulate that because it's it's very mysterious but i don't know we did the best we could yeah no i, I really love that that in all of the performances and there's also there's there's something in the way that he sings that's quite interesting in in kind of you having to master and, and adopt in that, you know, he's not someone who kind of opens his mouth a lot. And yet there is such a full projection to the delivery. Yeah. Um, and so is that quite it. tricky to to master for you? Yeah, I don't know how he does it. I watched that. So, yeah, I, 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 uh, I think a lot of it is really people that are really phenomenal singers. Part of it's just physiological, you know, it's like their their bone structure and their sinuses and the way their nose and their throat. It's just it's it's just dumb luck, part of it, you know. But Ron, our our teacher, he was always like, 
the biggest mistake people make when they try to sing like emotionally is they just they just try too hard and he's like a lot of these really heartbreaking emotional songs are best sung as, as if you're just bored to tears like you just you're basically just reciting the phone book or something like you don't the more you kind of angst and you know moodiness you try and put into it you're probably gonna miss notes and it's not gonna it's not gonna be pleasurable to listen to you know? um and i t-bone burnett turned me on to this uh i think it was t-bone or maybe it was john this video i'm not gonna remember the name of it it was this really weird movie like an experimental movie but there's it's it's basically in the movie they have george jones um singing take me and it's just him and a guitar and he's got like a beer and a cigarette and and, he, and he's just sitting in a studio and he says well what do you want me to sing oh take me and he just sits there and sings it like like he even kind of messes up one lyric, like he can't hardly remember it or something, but he just sings it like, like it's no big deal. And it's the most incredible mind blowing version of that song. Um, I hate to say it cause you know, Tammy's not, it's just him, but, but it just really, uh, every time I watch it, it just took my breath away. And, it didn't look like any big heavy lifting to him. He was just he was like, oh yeah, okay, I'll sing that, fine, you know. Because you had the chance to to play him over the course of so many years throughout the series, you know, we see we see elements of impulsiveness in him, you know, throughout his life, but it, it manifests in very different ways. And, you know, there's much more kind of fast paced impulsiveness when in his younger years, then, you know, even just looking at that, the last episode where he's trying to convince Tammy to come with him and he's in the car and he's sitting there revving the engine, but he's not kind of speeding off in the way that he would have previously. Yeah. Um, and so how did you want to kind of find those adjustments of, you know, it's still always a part of him, but it, it kind of expresses itself in a very different way as he gets older. I think he knew if he did that, he'd probably never see her again. And he realized in that moment that it was more important to see her again than it was to, to exercise his own frustration. You know? I mean, oh man, I even just thinking about that gets me all shook up. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough to have... Uh, those, those, that love that they had is like, in a way, it's almost like a curse, you know? Like they can't, they know they can't be together, but they can't stop loving each other. It's crazy. But, uh, yeah, it's weird when you like try and act like you're an older person. Um, you're worried that people are just gonna say, what the hell? What's he doing? Um, but uh, I've been told my whole life that, I, uh, or at least, actually, I heard it more when I was younger. I don't hear it so much anymore, but that I, I have an old soul or something. So I guess that just kind of comes through in those moments. Yeah. There's also something really heartbreaking in in watching some of the self-destructive behavior because it always comes across from such a place of vulnerability or, you know, pain from his younger self, like when he's in Vegas and he just feels so insecure in the clothing and he doesn't feel like he's good enough to be yeah. doing this show and to be stepping out and he feels very fraudulent and like people are going to see that. So even though it's very self-destructive for him to run away from the situation, we really understand the vulnerability in him. Um, and was that a really key component for you to make sure that you were kind of always capturing the vulnerabilities and the insecurities to kind of oh, understand yeah. where that was coming from. Yeah, I didn't have any, I had zero interest in, I don't know, acting like some macho, don't give a damn, 
you know, the stereotypical rugged country. I, I just didn't, I didn't feel, it didn't ring true to me. You know, I think George was a little boy his whole life. He was a little boy. He was always a little boy. As I think a lot of great artists are, they just remain children and they try really hard to be grownups, but just sort of pan out. <laughs> And there, there's some moments later in the series where it almost feels like he doesn't have the language to express certain things when he kind of adopts the the duck quacks. And yeah. I thought that was such an interesting thing to have to try and do in a performance because you have to deliver it in a way that it never feels like a joke and it doesn't feel like a comedic thing. But again, it comes from that place of, I don't have another way to express myself right now. So I'm just going to kind of create a diversion in the space. Um, and so how did how did you find the way that you wanted to land those? Because it it's something that kind of repeats itself a little bit. Yeah, to me, it was just kind of like this Tourette's he developed as a result of all the trauma he'd been through. And probably also... And frustration in general with uh, the ineffectiveness of communication anyway, like even if you don't quack like a duck, even if you use uh, the Queen's English, most people don't understand what the hell the other person's talking about, you know, so you might as well quack like a duck half the time. And when you were in production, you've mentioned that there was an interview that you would listen to every day driving to set with with George and Tammy. Um, and I was interested in what what was what was the essence of like the specific interview that you found really useful just to kind of get yourself into that mindset every single day when you were going on to set. Well, frankly, a lot of it was uh, dialect. I just wanted to hear his voice, you know, as much as I could and try and get as close as I could to it. I'm I'm not. I'm not one of those actors who's like a marble with dialects, you know, I struggle with them. So I really lean on that a lot. Um, but it's an interesting interview because it's an interview that the record company did. And it was after they finally managed to get George to come over to Tammy's label. And, and they just, it wasn't long after they had had Georgette, I think. And the, they were kind of blissed out, but, you know, George also talked a lot about how hard it had been for him coming up, you know, it's, you know, Tammy didn't have to play the circuit quite as long as George did. George really had to pay a lot of dues, you know, he was out on that honky tonk trail and, you know, putting singles out, but not, none of them really, making much of a dent in the in the charts and and Tammy was a lot more medi meteoric, I think. So so they're very happy. They seem very happy and yet there's this kind of very subtle undertone of like it's not even resentment. It's just different. It's like, yeah, he's a he's a journeyman, you know? And I think that comes through in the show. Like well, when you see at the beginning of the show, he's already kind of had it. <laughs> you know, that's the very first thing you see is him flushing money down the toilet. You know. And in also talking about Waco, the aftermath, you know, that that's also something where you're playing an FBI negotiator based on, on a real person, but it's a very different scope to playing George because the general public don't know details about him and what his mannerisms are and, and all those sorts of aspects. And so how does that create a different approach for you and still wanting to be very judicious in terms of the research, but kind of not going into the role with audiences already having a preconceived notion of who this character is going to be? Yeah. Well, with Waco, I have the great benefit of actually knowing Gary Nestor. Um, he's my friend and we, text and talk and he, when when we're shooting he'll come and visit and watch and um with the aftermath series uh the Dowdle brothers were making some connections that um are very logical and and and, 
and very uh, reasonable. Uh, they're not. It's not necessarily what Gary actually did in real life. There's a, some discrepancies uh, there, and but Gary was okay with it um, because he appreciated the the point they were making, and he thought it was valuable for them to do that. But it's not. I don't get too hung up on the exact uh, verisimilitude to you know real life because it's not that would be a mistake. It's not there. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I love playing Gary and, and, and I love exploring uh, the whole negotiation process because I feel like what a negotiator does and what an actor does is, is uh, they have a lot in common. So it's, it's, uh, it's really fascinating to, to explore it yeah and because you'd already played him in in the original series Waco in kind of coming back to the character um you know did you were there certain things that you were kind of researching a little bit deeper or did you feel like because you'd done so much research about FBI negotiating and and kind of getting to know Gary and and all of the aspects that came with it in the first season that you'd kind of covered the ground that you needed in order to pick up in in the aftermath it which is very much about the emotional fallout of it all yeah yeah I didn't I didn't need to do too much prep on that i mean i felt like the scripts were so solid and uh, everything made sense to me um and i have a yeah from the the first go around i have a familiarity uh w- 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 well i definitely had a familiarity with the oklahoma city i mean i remember that like it was yesterday and uh you know i've read gary's book a couple of times and and that's kind of my my Bible for, for doing it. It's his book. It's very, uh, very helpful. If you're, it's always nice if the person you're playing writes a book about their life, it just makes it so much easier. And in, in stepping back into the character and, and getting that space to explore what is the impact after going through something like that, you know, and even in the scripts, there's a moment where he's talking about the fact that every single night he's, dreaming about it and thinking about it. And it's something that clearly is still sitting with him every single day in the aftermath. Um, And so what was kind of the, the emotional impact that that had on the character and how you wanted to play him? That was tricky uh, because, you know, Gary is not an unhinged individual, you know, he's, he's pretty composed. And again, much like the situation with George Jones, it's hard to know just because I have a relationship with Gary. I'm I'm not, I don't know if he's telling me every single thought and feeling he's ever had about it. You know, some of that he might keep to himself and rightfully so. I mean, uh, and there may be things he doesn't want everybody to know, you know, Um, but Gary never, you know, Gary never snapped. He never lost the capacity to do his job or show up at the office. You know, it never, it never went that far south. Um, And so it's, but you do, you do want to convey the sense that it wasn't just uh, another, the significance of the event, it, it, he has a respect for that and that it had an impact on him. Yeah. I mean, the the way that you're describing that, you know, it's it's not like he snapped. There's such an interesting aspect to a character like this, particularly in the lens that we see him in the show, because there's so many moments where he has to leave himself behind in the moment in order to be able to do his job effectively. You know, he has to kind of mold himself into what that conversation needs and what the other person needs to hear from him. And so it's It's not about Yeah. (laughs) But are are there interesting challenges that come with kind of... Well, and he has, he has to be able to forgive himself. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, Gary has forgiven himself for wait. He's not like walking around flagellating himself with a cat of nine tails. You know, 
It doesn't always work out. He does the best he can. He tries. Sometimes things really blow up in his face. And and he just has to forgive himself or say, I did the best I could. I don't know what else I could have done. And because uh, otherwise, you know, he, he wouldn't have been able to do it all as long as he did. And one scene that's really great to watch is is the moment where it's the the court scene where he's testifying in the show and it starts off, you know, very much trying to adhere to the party line and then kind of reaching a point where that that part of him that is always going to say the uncomfortable truth outside realizes that he has to speak the truth. And so how did you want to go into that scene and finding where is the tipping point where he kind of reaches reaches his limit where he no longer can adhere to the party line? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of that's dictated by the the script, obviously. I mean, the Dowdles uh, decide, you know, what the breaking point is. But um, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, just being in the same room with those people again and, you know, the look on their faces and... You know, Gary has a sense... He, he, he has a deep, deep sense of decency. He's a very decent person. And at a certain point, I think that takes over, you know, no matter what your instructions have been from your superiors, you know. Um, I think Gary really believes in fairness and decency and, you know, and it's not just lip service. I think he really believes in it. So at a certain point, it just becomes untenable. You know, you just, yeah. you just, it just comes out. Yeah. I mean, these, these are both such incredible performances and really just show so much of the, the breadth of what you always manage to bring to the table as a, as a performer and playing such different roles. So thank you so much for talking about both of these projects today. I really appreciate it, Michael. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs>